Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to our study in the book of Zechariah, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his leading? There is much that we need to address. There are many things that we're going to need to consider. Because as we get further into this book, we're going to be given many symbols. There have been several documents that have recently come out that are asking us to consider symbols similar to this. We're going to need to consider carefully that which we see, especially in light of the rules that Father Miller had used. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction as we open his word. Gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you, Father, we ask for your forgiveness of our sins. We ask, Father, that you may enlighten our minds. Help us to understand, to carefully consider all of the symbols that are presented within the portions of Scripture that we are about to read. Direct us now. Guide us, Father. Show us that that you would have us to do. We need you, Father. We need your direction, we need your guidance, and we need your blessing. Help us now, place us where you would have us to be. Father, at this time, there are questions that are being risen that are troubling to many of us. <laughs> we know that you are not a God of confusion. We know that you provide light and that you provide a sure place for our feet to walk. May your angels attend us. May your spirit direct us so that we may follow you wherever you lead. May it be your character that leads. May our characters submit to you. To this end, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we addressed another letter that had been written. At this point, there are several things that we're going to need to be looking at out of the book of Zechariah. For we need to consider carefully the witnesses that are being placed before us. Now, Sister White wrote in 1897, too much dependence is placed upon preachers while the house-to-house -house work is much neglected. What does this mean to us, each one, at this time? Are we to forsake the gathering together of ourselves with others? No, of course not. We're supposed to be doing it more often as the day of Christ approaches. Yet the house-to-house -house work is being much neglected. What does that mean to you? To try to be with those who are close at hand as, as much as possible. Okay. Okay.
There are many that would see that their, quote, duty is just to come, assemble at a church. Yet there are many that are discouraged. There are many that are questioning. There are many that are asking why that remain within their houses. Paul, the faithful apostle, says, I kept back nothing that is profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not interesting that we would find this in Acts 2020 and Acts 2021? Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. She continues, I bow my soul in humility before God, seeking for that wisdom which he has promised to give to all who ask in faith. Now, let's let's look at this very directly. This letter was being written six years after 1888. This letter was being written 50 years after 1844. At that time, after so many years in the service of our creator, she writes that I bow my soul in humility before God, seeking for that wisdom which he has promised to give all in faith. If she is having to do this after 50 years, how much more do we need to be doing this today? In our daily habits, in our daily practices, we must be living exponents of sacred truth. My prayer is that the Lord may revive his work in the hearts of those who know the truth. If she's having to pray that the Lord revive his work, then was the work being accepted in the hearts of those of the leadership and of the church at that time. Those who are laborers together with God will ever work in Christ's lines. <clears throat> Christ says, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. All the work we do for the conversion of souls will be effectual only as we depend absolutely upon the presence and power of heavenly agencies. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Every vessel that is meet for the master's use is clean and pure, emptied of self. Oh, for the refining, cleansing power of God that we may be used to his name's glory. We must not falter now, but press forward <clears throat> from victory unto victory. This point was well covered last week. What type of vessel is it that can be used by the Spirit of God? An empty vessel. And what does that mean for us today to be an empty vessel? Well, we need to be emptied of self, of our own plans, ambitions, ideas, and receive whatever it is God wants us to receive. How many are willing to do this today?
At the outset, I would have to say not many. Now in letter 61 in 1896, she states, you little understand the soul's great need and longing. Some are wrestling with doubt, almost in despair, almost hopeless. You need to understand the fourth chapter of Zechariah. <clears throat> the two olive trees that stand in the presence of God empty through the two golden pipes, the golden oil out of themselves into the golden bowl from which the lamps of the sanctuary are fed. The golden oil represents the Holy Spirit. So if the golden oil from these two olive trees represent the Holy Spirit, then what do these two olive trees represent? This the heavenly messengers impart to the preachers of the word. The golden oil is being imparted is that not the way we would understand this paragraph in the way that it's being written yes this is a golden oil out of themselves and that's referring to the golden pipes the ministers of righteousness are to be continually replenished, that they in turn may impart to the church, giving it greater strength and efficiency. Again, she, she repeats, Zechariah 4, verse 6, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The Lord's servants can obtain victories, not by mere outward manifestations, but by inward purity, by cleanliness of soul, heart piety, by holiness, which is wholesome, wholeness to God. They are dependent upon the grace of God, represented by the holy oil emptied from the olive trees through the golden pipes into the golden bowl of the candlestick. What can I say that shall make upon our ministers an impression never to be forgotten? The angels are present in the assembly where the word of God is preached. If this fact could be riveted in the mind of the speaker, with what awe would he give utterance to the truth of God's word? Nothing is as precious in the sight of God as his church. There is nothing regarded with such jealous care. God is offended when his representatives descend to the use of cheap trifling words. The cause of truth is dishonored. Men judge of the whole ministry by the man whom they hear. And the enemies of truth will make the most of his errors. Brothers and sisters, this paragraph is fearful in the way that it's presented. <laughs> when others are judging the entire ministry, the entire movement, by the efforts of one, it is the enemies of truth that make the most of errors. When we stop and we look at the times that points have been presented for consideration, and yet we come back with a questioning, haughty spirit, Oh, well, this person, he's too difficult to understand. This person, he's he just, he's too harsh. Yet, what was being said of John the Baptist? Was he not being questioned by many 
during the time of Christ was his methods not being attacked as being too harsh and being too difficult. And what of what of Father Miller? There are going to be messages that are going to be given that many are going to have difficulty with. Not all messages are going to be easy. Not all can be those that are going to be accepted and accepted gratefully. God chooses men of a humble and contrite spirit through whom he can work and imparts to them his wisdom. <clears throat> they are little in their own eyes and will not interpret success as the result of their own smartness, their own intelligence, but they will glorify God, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. If men are entrusted with great responsibilities, this is no assurance of their fitness for their position. <clears throat> the assurance comes after test and after trial. If they evidence that they sense their own weakness, if they make God their trust, the Lord will supply them with his wisdom. If they ask in faith, they will increase in knowledge and ability. If they depend upon God day by day, the stages of development will show a symmetrical growth heavenward. If they walk day by day in humility and contrition and wholeness, in the strictest integrity, doing justice to their fellow men, showing reverence and honor to God by being obedient and true to him, keeping the living principles of righteousness, God will honor them. The path of sincerity and integrity is not a path free from all obstruction. In the place of becoming faint-hearted and discouraged, those to whom God has entrusted responsibilities are to see in every difficulty a call to prayer. How often are we doing this? How often are we praying about everything. They are to consult not finite men who are boastful and show a masterly independence, but the great teacher who is given to every man his work in his vineyard. They are to be faithful workers, always in co-partnership with the great worker. They will not slack they will not call slackly done work faithful and thorough service. They will stand fast against wrong, discerning the right from the wrong, the evil from the good. They will appreciate that which God estimates. There is no favoritism with God and no partiality. No hypocrisy should be introduced or maintained in our households, in our churches, or in our institutions. Are we not told to worry about nothing but pray about everything? Yet, how often is this the path that we choose? Over these last several months, <clears throat> I've had conversations with many. There are those that believe that when they fall ill, they should consider for a short time that which is written in scripture and is presented in what we call the health message. <clears throat> but then after a time, because the consultation is not of 
their liking. They choose to seek from man what they see as being wisdom. Is this the way in which we are to walk? No, it's not. And I'm posting something on Facebook to do with that topic today. Okay. <clears throat> so many times there have been those that decide that man's wisdom is superior to that of God's. We need to see, we need to accept that the path of sincerity and integrity is not a path that is free from obstruction. When these obstructions come before us, we need to seek our Heavenly Father in prayer and not seek man. We are not to place our trust in the arm of flesh but we are to trust in the omnipotent arm of our creator. When Daniel was required to partake of the luxuries of the king's table, he did not fly into a passion. Neither did he express a determination to eat and drink as he pleased. Was Daniel following the health message as this is presented in this part of scripture. Without one speaking one word of defiance, he took the matter to God. He and his companions sought wisdom from the Lord and when they came forth from earnest prayer, their decision was made. With true courage and Christian courtesy, Daniel presented the case to the officer who had them in charge, asking that they might be granted a simple diet. These youths felt that their religious principles were at stake, and they relied upon God, whom they loved and they served. Their request was granted, for they had obtained favor with God and with men. So if Daniel was following the health message, was he not indeed following after the right arm of the gospel? Was he not presenting the message of the gospel before the court of Nebuchadnezzar? <clears throat> is this not the work that we are to be doing today men in every position of trust need to take their place in the school of Christ and heed the injunction of a great teacher learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We have no excuse for manifesting one wrong trait of character. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In your dealings with others, whatever you see or hear that needs to be corrected, first seek the Lord for wisdom and for grace, that in trying to be faithful, you may not be rude. Ask him to give you the gentleness of Christ. Then you will be true to your duty, true to your position of trust, and true to God, a faithful steward overcoming natural and acquired tendencies to evil. None but a wholehearted Christian can be a perfect gentleman. But if Christ is abiding in the soul, his spirit will be revealed in the manner, in the words, and the actions. Gentleness 
and love cherished in the heart will appear in self-denial and true courtesy. Such workers will be the light of the world. In Battle Creek, or for us today, in the General Conference, or even in the movement, much money has been expanded, which would have brought honor and glory to God had it been invested in foreign missions. Oh, how we have needed money in this mission, and still the interests are, set, are centering in Battle Creek. We need some of the facilities you have there, but no one feels a burden to spare some of your abundance. Oh, that the Lord would open blind eyes to discern what you are doing. The Lord's treasures have been selfishly invested according to the devising of men to make a grand appearance to give character to the work. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. In giving character to the work, the Spirit of God will accomplish more than any expensive buildings. Difficulties have been accumulating for years. Pride has budded. Okay, the comment in the chat says, let's not make the grave mistake King Asa did from Second Chronicles 16.12. Why are we being given this example? How can we apply this here? Referring to, back to relying more on man's so-called health policies than God's. I, I was just thinking of this verse. It says, Asa in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Great is a supplied word there. Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. Now, it's fine to maybe to get a consultation from them, but I found a lot of times they're wrong. And I haven't had a, had a medic on my case since the 90s. I mean, I've gone to a couple of walk-in clinics since then, but that's it. That, they're ridiculous. Like, I went in for a pap smear once. I said, if I have a bladder infection, can you prescribe something natural? And he said, well, I just graduated from med school, and I know nothing about natural remedies. I said, that says it all. Bye. That's the last time I consulted a medic. That was about eh, maybe 15, 14, 15 years ago. It's an interesting situation. For me, I have found it in very intriguing whether I have consulted those medical professionals graduated with their degrees, given them a man, or whether I have consulted some <clears throat> that have been of the Adventist faith. In my life, I have only had one doctor ever choose to pray with me before examining. And he was not an Adventist. That's appalling. I find it, yes, appalling, but also very shocking. So I have chosen to pay attention, sometimes closing my mouth. <clears throat> but watching very carefully that our Heavenly Father has given us instruction. And when we are choosing 
to accept his instruction and heed his word, that we will find the health that we seek. Now, <clears throat> the attention of Elijah was attracted to Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who with the servants was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. He was educator, director, and worker. Far from city and court dissipation, Elisha had received his education. He had been trained in habits of simplicity, of obedience to his parents and to God. Thus, in quietude and contentment, he was prepared to do the humble work of cultivating the soil. <clears throat> but through of a meek and quiet spirit, Elisha had no changeable character. But though of a meek and quiet spirit, Elijah had no changeable character. Integrity and fidelity and the love and fear of God were his. He had the characteristics of a ruler. But with it all was the meekness of one who would serve. His mind had been exercised to be faithful in the little things, to be faithful in whatever he should do. So that if God should call him to act more directly for him, he would be prepared to hear his voice. This was the lesson that he had learned, to be obedient. Is this not the lesson that we are being taught today? Sharp testimonies must be born, testimonies that reveal sin. It is often difficult to make the impression upon human minds that must be made to enable them to distinguish sacred, eternal interest from common things. The witness for God often repeats truth clearly and distinctly, and he thinks there is no more to be said now. But there are those who, like Simon Magus, think that sacred things of God are merchandise. There are learned men who, like Nicodemus, say, how can these things be? John 3, 9. God's worker is then grieved and astonished. Disappointment comes and he says, what is the use of working? Clear and striking arguments, illustrations appropriate and right to the point, earnestness and and hope to save a soul from death, all have failed to arouse the benumbed senses. Because of the failure of his efforts, his heart becomes discouraged. But this will never do. We are to remember that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The carnal mind is as dark as midnight, and its illumination must come from the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting that, again, she is repeating Zechariah 4, 6 here. So we are being reminded that our minds will be open to the word of God by the Holy Spirit. We must do our part. And what is our part? We must pray that we are receptive to that spirit and invite the spirit in. Okay, but are we also not required to study so that the words of God may be recalled to our minds by the spirit? Amen. The most simple representation will be the most effective. The work is to be done by every believing child of God. None are to fail or be discouraged in their service for the master. Whatever the ignorance of spiritual things is shown by learned men. This is why these studies that we have been doing every morning are so important. We wrestle with some, some thoughts, some passages that can be very hard to understand. We are looking how these studies can help us to explain 
situations that have looked to be dark and foreboding. The very prophecies about Christ's first advent were made dark and foreboding by those that were supposedly priests that were choosing to teach more fables and commandments of men than the direct word of God. Are we any different at this time in the way that we have seen things than what they were at that time? Are we not being called by Christ himself to learn of him who is meek and lowly of heart? Do not begin at once to talk of temporal things, but let the people understand you have come as a loving, sympathizing heart to save them from ruin. Women can often do this delicate work better than men. Earnest, God-fearing women can do a precious work for the master. This kind of work is the remedy for lukewarm, selfish, covetous souls. They will, if they work to save others, melt away the cold, icy atmosphere which has surrounded their souls. The Lord is soon to come, and we have only a remnant of time in which to work. You may be often disappointed because you find your earnest, loving interest meets no response. But the experience of the greatest teacher the world has ever known is before you. He was refused, opposed, rejected, and derided. One of the best examples of this is found in the Gospel of John. And we would find this at John 6, verse 66. Let us consider our Savior's life and say, I will not fail nor be discouraged. The system of labor, of personal labor, will do a work that few can anticipate. To carry it out in the spirit of Jesus because you are conscious you are doing him service will often prove a cross. But bear in mind that the Holy Spirit is the worker. The human agent working for God is not alone. What a promise this is for us. What support can we draw from this? How can we better serve our Lord and our Savior? Labor and perseverance in tenderness, in compassion, prayerfulness, and love will do more than sermons. The Lord Jesus, in giving his life for the saving of the world from the curse of sin, intended great, greater things than our eyes have yet witnessed. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is waiting for channels through whom to work. Is the bride ready to make herself ready. If the Holy Spirit is having to wait, is Christ also not waiting? If all would do the work to which they were appointed, thousands of people might be saved. Satan will not always triumph. The Spirit of God will be poured out upon the church just as soon as the vessels are prepared to receive it. What does that say to you? If this Spirit... Go ahead. I'm really startled there. Summer says, if all would do the work to which they were appointed, thousands of people might be saved. I mean, Lord, help me. Lord, help all of us. 
But what does it say to you as well? <clears throat> that the spirit of God will be poured out upon the church just as soon as the vessels are prepared to receive it. We need to be prepared. I mean, I was praying this morning that we would all see ourselves as God sees us and that we would permit him to remove sin from our lives and to transform us. And we should be doing that daily. I mean, it's a work. It's definitely a dying to self. But if we don't do this, if we're unwilling, if we're setting up blockades to the Lord, trying to change us in, into his likeness, we're going to be lost. I mean, we need to realize this. There's a poet <clears throat> with whom I'm, I'm a little bit familiar that had written, oh, the power, the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us. Oh, man, I know that. But it's more important that God sees us because humanity can judge us and they can be wrong. Agreed. Uh, I'd rather hear from God than somebody else. <laughs> but if the power of God cannot be poured out because the vessels are not prepared, and if the vessels are to be clean for the Spirit of God, to be able to infill them, then what does it say about us? Is it not saying that we are not praying, studying, and looking to learn so that we can become clean? There's always more that we can do. How long shall the faith of the people of God remain so limited and so narrow? Why not exercise faith that the Holy Spirit shall so increase in large measure in divine blessings and intensify human agencies that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. We need to consider this today because the channels through whom the Holy Spirit is waiting to work is us. And as it said in the chat, and I thank you for this, it means that we are the ones hindering the work of God to move on in accordance with his order. Amen. The Holy Spirit is waiting. The bridegroom is waiting. All that has gone before has had little of the power of the Holy Spirit. through these channels that are not clean. How much longer are we going to make Christ wait?
Manuscript 130 of 1897. I believe we covered this this last week. The power of the Holy Spirit is needed to chase away our unbelief and our unchristlike attributes. We must see our need of a physician. We are sick and we do not know it. May the Lord convert the hearts of his workmen. When there is a converted ministry, then look for results. <clears throat> is a converted ministry a critical ministry? Are they expressing doubt and criticism of their brothers and sisters? Now, on the other hand, is a converted ministry a, con a critical need for us today? It certainly is. You cannot convert your own hearts. I'm not saying it. If you have a problem with that statement, let's take it up with Mrs. White. The conversion of hearts can only be wrought by the Holy Spirit. In every stage of the work, let the educators advance, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The question has been asked, what kind of vessels does the spirit ordinarily use? What does Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30. When the workers in any branch of the work labor in self, they put upon themselves a yoke which Christ does not cooperate with them in carrying it. What kind of an admonition is this to us? Are we to try to labor in paths of our own devising? Nope. What kind of vessels are meat for the master's use? Empty vessels. We've addressed this now for two Sabbaths. We have been addressing this in our studies on Friday nights. It has been being shown that here we have a message that is to be given. But how often is that message that is to be given to the world being interpreted wrong. How many times is this message being given by those that are not empty vessels? Several years ago, <clears throat> I was listening to the comment from a friend of long standing, telling me that a church in this area was truly presenting the third angel's message. Yet had this been the case, what would the result have been of that representation of the third angel's message? Would it not have gone out with much light and power As we have learned, these messages must arrive. They must be formalized. They must then be empowered. But what is used <clears throat> for this to occur? Empty vessels. When we empty the soul from every defilement, we are clean vessels. Are we emptied of self? 
are we cured of selfish planning, whereby we are to be given every favorable chance while others get along as best they can. Oh, for less self-occupation. May the Lord purify and cleanse his people, teachers, and churches. The Lord has given a rule for the guidance of all. From this standard, there can be no careless departure. But there has been, and still is, a swerving from righteous principles. How long shall this condition of things exist? How can the master use us as vessels for holy service until we empty ourselves and make room for the Spirit of God to work? Is this not a message for the movement today? The word of truth should ever be in the mind and in the heart. That those who believe the truth shall be prepared to speak a word in season. The seed of truth sown in a few well-chosen words may appear to have but a small beginning. But that word spoken from the heart may take root and bring spring up and bear abundant harvest of fruit. In ourselves, we can do nothing. We all are weak. But if we make the most of the Lord's entrusted talent, his divine power will give us efficacy. The great apostle exclaims, who is sufficient for these things? But many whose sphere of influence would seem narrow and weak, their abilities limited, their opportunities few, their knowledge not extended, their influence small, may if they will let the peace of God rule in their hearts, do as much good and more than those who have efficiency, especially if they trust to their efficiency. It is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The strength and the talents belong to God. And who can estimate the great work that may be done in the sowing of the gospel seed. It will be as the morsel of leaven hidden in the meal. Manuscript 67, 1897. In taking upon himself humanity, Christ is connected by relationship to the whole human family. But to any church, this relation is of no avail without a personal faith. The identification of heart and mind and soul and strength with Jesus Christ. In thoughts and desires, in words and actions, there must be an identity with Christ, a constant imparting of his spiritual life. It is and it is in thus constantly receiving and constantly imparting that we receive that makes us elements of light. This next paragraph is repeating Zechariah 4, 1 and 2, and verses 4 through 6. Now, when we're looking at this, the angel that came and talked with Zechariah was talking to him, and what did he need to do with Zechariah? What is being said here? The angel came, the angel that talked with me came again and waked me.
we have the parable of the ten virgins. We have the wise and the foolish. Yet all of them were asleep. Correct? So is the angel that's speaking to Zechariah not speaking to us today? Have we not been, as those wise and foolish virgins, asleep? And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me, as a man that is wakened out of sleep. And said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? And the angel that talked with me answered, and said unto me, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, as we covered a couple of weeks ago, this can alternately still be read, not by army, excuse me, not by might, nor by army, but by my spirit. All of the time, we have the ability to rely upon God. But oh, too many times, we are choosing more to make it so that we are relying upon those that are acclaimed by man to be ministers, to be doctors, to be learned, rather than applying ourselves, to learn for ourselves. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, what be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, my question for you is simple. Given what we're reading in some of these recent letters, are these two anointed ones, Moses and Elijah? Or would these be seen as being the Old and the New Testament? How else can we apply this? How else should we apply it? I think the old and the new. Okay. Was there a time that the old and the new testaments laid in the streets? Was that application ever correct? Yes, it was because it says that uh, if someone hates them, it simply means fire will come down from heaven, which simply means it's talking about... Uh, Elijah and the plagues about Moses. Then he talks about also where our Lord was slain. Uh, it's to do with persecution, which simply means when you look at this, we, we, we just see the Old and the New Testament. And that's uh, during the French Revolution. Right. Now, we need to consider carefully that 
these may also be stated to apply in other ways for this time, but in all ways. And it has been the word of God that has been set aside. It has been his word that we find many giving lip service with. Yet these are for us the instructions for how we are to approach the work that is to be before us. How is the dry, disconnected sapling to become one with the parent vine stock? How is it to be made a partaker of the life and the nourishment of the living vine? Only by being grafted into the vine, by being brought into the closest relationship possible. Fiber by fiber, vein by vein, the twig holds fast to the life-giving vine until the life of the vine becomes one with the branch and the branch produces fruit like that of the vine. Manuscript 73, 1897. If any man among you seemeth to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. James 1, 26 and 27. Those who do this work must seek strength and wisdom from above. They must be refreshed by drinking from the stream of life that their labors may not become exhaustive for those who are doing God's service will strive to communicate more than they receive. Therefore, provision has been made for every soul. Again, she repeats Zechariah 4, 6. The golden oil Representing the Holy Spirit is communicated to God's servants by the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. This will supply the necessities of all who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we make no preparation by self-examination and prayer, we cannot receive the precious oil. What does that say to you? Is it not important for us to study, to examine ourselves, and be much in prayer so that we can receive the Holy Spirit? True. Now we are being told. Please read Isaiah 58. Great light is given in this chapter. The earnest prayer from the humble contrite heart will be heard and will be answered. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. James 17, 7 and 8. We have a right to expect if we cooperate with God by consecrating ourselves soul, body, and spirit to his keeping. There will then be no cheap experience. 
No foolish talking or evil speaking will be heard. The tongue will utter light. Excuse me. The tongue will utter right things. Now, what is important about Isaiah 58? We have 14 verses here. In these 14 verses, Mrs. White states that great light is given in this chapter. This great light is also being shown with what we're looking at through Zechariah. Right. And in the chat, I see that, you know, that that says that that is Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8, which we just read. But is this statement here, please read Isaiah 58. Is it not saying that there's great light in that chapter as well? Yes, because uh, it's a chapter which is uh, bringing in uh, a lot of warnings. Right. <clears throat> now, in 14 total verses, we should be able to read this, read it at this point before we close our, our meeting today. So if you would, please turn with me to Isaiah 58. And in these 14 verses, we should be able to as a group, read it through. I'll read the first three. If someone else would read the next three, so on and so on, we'll be able to quickly go through this and consider what is being said. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast, you will find pleasure and exact all your labors. I'll read the next three if it's all right. Please. Behold, ye fast, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his he head as a bullish and to be spread to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast? and a acceptable day to the Lord. Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loosen the bands of the wicked, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressors go free, that ye break every yoke? Amen. 
Someone else read the next three. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? And when thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. Then shall thy light break forth in the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shalt thou call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. Okay, can someone else read 10, 11, and 12? And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and uh, satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And, thy shall, and they that shall be of thee shall build the old west places Thou shalt rise up the foundation of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairers of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Here we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, all in agreement. Because in all of these things, they are showing us that it is not by the power of man, but it is by the power of God that this work is going to be completed. Now from the chat, there is a, there's a comment. Now is this uh, for sec, it, it, I, I'm assuming this is second Corinthians 13.5. Yes, it is. It says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, prove your own selves, Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. And I, I was especially thinking of that when we read Isaiah 58.1. I thought, okay, all this time I thought it meant, okay, let's go and decry against all the sins of the mainstream churches. But it's also addressed to us personally. In these situations... Does God begin his work within a church or within a movement, within a structure or within a, a group? Or does he begin his work within the individual hearts? He calls us one by one. Okay. So are we not to follow after the pattern of Christ? 
Amen. Correct. So if the work is going to begin, it must begin within our own hearts today. It must begin one soul at a time. If it is to begin one soul at a time, what is preventing us from going forward? We have before us a challenge. We have before us an admonition. God cannot work in vessels that are not clean, that are not empty. Have we not observed that from what we've been reading these last several weeks? We must be emptied of self to be able to be used of the Spirit, to be able to be used of God. What's happening right now in the division within this work is because we are not emptied of self. As I've said many times, I cannot point a finger without having three pointing right back at me. So today, my challenge for each that are in this meeting that may view this session later is to become empty to self, to place this before our Heavenly Father to let him show us that which we need to have removed so that we can indeed become the empty vessels that his spirit can use. This is my challenge to us all today for this next week so that we can go forward in these studies to understand more of what God would have us to know. As we finish, keep Jesus constantly in view, telling of one mightier than yourself, God would have his own people true to principle, servants of, great, of the great creator, doing their work as shepherds of the flock of God, ever presenting the greater shepherd, that the eyes of their hearers might be attracted to the fountain of light, and that Christ our Lord shall be exalted in word, in manner, in spirit, in calm self-possession. Let the watchword be, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Then the angel talked with me and said, Knowest not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of God to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. The work before every soul who has the light of Bible truth is to allow himself to be worked by the Holy Spirit. God's people are appointed to prepare the world for the great event of the coming of our Lord. Are we prepared today? Are we ready to give a message? Are we united?
Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we have great need of you. We have not done that which is required of us. So in this, we have sinned. Help us today that we may seek to become empty of self, that we may become the clean vessels that you need to go forward in spirit and in truth, to do the work that you would have us to do so that this earth, can become your throne, your footstool, that it can become as you would have it to be as it was once when it was created. Direct us this day, be with us, we ask, For this we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.